um, I would like to open the floor for your own questions that I'm sure uh, you do have for them. Yes. Can you please uh, introduce yourselves before the question? Uh, thank you. I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project, and I had a question for uh, Eugenio. Um, you mentioned $300 billion for soil reclamation, for repairing degraded lands. That's the first time I've heard that number. It seems small. Uh, what is the sort of basis or the strategy that would $300 would buy in, in reclaiming land? Eugenio, can you, can you please, no, just answer that one. It was very specific and directed to you. Three hundred billion per per year, uh, just to restore uh, lands to a healthy level. That's estimates by IFPRI, a colleague Efraim Koya and some other people from IFPRI and Bon Joaquin von Braun and his, and their colleagues. That is the current value. Doesn't include the value of ecosystems. There are other estimates that are far bigger. They're in the ten trillion dollars if you include all the potential services of ecosystems, and we get into all the debate on how you value those those services. Uh, that's uh, another study that if we didn't participate, I'm, I'm, I mentioned in a blog that I just wrote two or three days ago on, on how to finance these investments. Uh, so yes, it's just one block of the topic, A. B, they also include what would be the cost of not doing anything um, on the for the next um, years, and that's about $4.6 trillion over six years if you stay on, on, track. on track and not doing anything. On the other hand, if you invest, um, uh, you can, uh, it, 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 and, and on top of that, if you do not invest, then the losses will keep on compounding. So the, it depends very much on now versus the future and what your, your baseline. So there, as I said, there are different estimates. $3 billion is what the cost would be now, and but they, there may be a more expansive um, est estimates. Um, yes, Rob? Uh, Rob Foss of uh, IFPRI. Um, I just want to go back uh, basically to the the basic question of this forum, right? So what can the G20 achieve? Um, it's good to remind ourselves G20 is just an informal gathering of world leaders, right? It's not a multilateral organization. It doesn't have a specific mandate uh, to do things. So as was several times said, what well, can reach a consensus and push things forward. So um, the few things that G20, I think, have achieved in recent times is uh, Maximo referred to it with the global crisis. Okay, it's had a breakthrough in terms of reviving the IMF and increasing its firepower by um, agreeing on uh, 250 billion extra in SDRs so IMF could play its role as a uh, lender of last resorts during the crisis. And there was a few agreements on policy coordination to stave off the, the crisis. So that's the kind of thing that G20 can do, right? It's not an organization can do anything much than that. So having said that, so I'd like to hear a bit more specifically what initiative you would like this G20 meeting of this year to do in terms of having this breakthrough, like on soil. So would that be a big fund, investment fund, to restore soils, which then uh, uh, the G20 can say, well, we'll support this and let the right organizations uh, move this uh, move this forward. Uh, or on trade, there's some, uh, I was made some suggestions on trade, but what could the G20 agree what the WTO could not agree upon? So is there a breakthrough proposal we can see? So. I only need to hear one, then I will be satisfied. <laughs> All right, why don't you hold on one second? Uh, yes, Gina, if you want to. Um, thank you, Gina Chernikata from the Nature Conservancy. Um, you were talking about some of the best incentives, um, Augustine, but this could go to 
yourself, Maximo Eugenio, um, some of the best incentives to adopting uh, good agricultural um, practices. And um, I think one of a, a really core incentive would actually to value those assets, like just to really get down to the core value of those assets. Because in agriculture, one of the things we don't do is we don't place a market value on the quality of that soil, on the water, on the surrounding habitat that impacts the climate. And so I think um, if we actually were to value these assets, the incentives would automatically come up through the market and then assuming we got you know public policy rights. So just one very precise example. Um, right now, um, one of the reasons that you know, we can produce so um, efficiently in Latin America is that we don't have to irrigate much of our land. Whereas in North America, you have to irrigate like nobody's business, and it's very expensive. So to the extent that we aren't putting a dollar value on that water, and we continue to degrade that water and lose that water asset, suddenly that water is going to get a lot more expensive. And suddenly, a Latin America's ability to export um, is not going to look as good from a price point because we didn't take care of it now while we still have an opportunity to make those adjustments. So I just wanted to, you know, put that on the table and, and see if there's, you know, if it's a possibility to look at that angle. Thank you very much, Jeannie. Unfortunately, the two questions uh, may be uh, connected. So um, why don't we uh, give the opportunity uh, for the panelists to answer those two questions? Any takers? Maximo? Uh, on on uh, Rob, it, it's very difficult, no? So the reason why AMIs work out in, in that time was because of the crisis. So crises are good sometimes, like fires are good. You can handle, pri the problem is how to handle the fires. So if you handle the, the fires properly, then you can get something good from it. Uh, but one, one of the things that I, I believe this, this G20 can achieve. So for example, this concept of having a, a public good of information on soils, it, it could be something extremely useful for the world because it will reduce huge asymmetries of information of what you can do and where, and it is basically reducing inequality in terms of asymmetry of information. And that's something that, that could be linked to the third priority. Uh, now, the, the other type of things related to that one, for example, is issues about regulation. So if you look at the mining industry, mm -hmm. the mining industry already have a mechanism of regula regulation. Whenever somebody comes with FDI in mining, they have to map the life cycle of the mine, and they have to develop a fund to restore the site that they are going to exploit. And that fund is put in place in advance before you can do the concession. So why we don't think of those type of rules of the game in agriculture FDI, for example, that will help us to develop this multi-million dollar fund? Because when we talk about the, the 300 billion, then I go back to the G7 of Germany, I think, where they wanted to have a flow of money to eliminate hunger and malnutrition. Then which one I do? I do the soil, so I do the malnutrition. And they were not able to agree to the one that were basically the kids were dying. So how we set up priorities? And I think we need to put that in, in, in the picture to be able to, uh, to come into it. So as long as these are issues that can come up with some regulatory mechanisms uh, that we can put in place or agreement, like fertilizers is another case. We talk about soils, we talk about fertilizers. It's hugely concentrated. Why is hugely concentrated? Because you don't have uh, plants of fertilizers in Africa, for example. And that doesn't make any sense. And then you can force the MDVs uh, to create business plans to be able to bring them up and to do the financing for Nigeria to finally have their plan. So I think those things you can push. Uh, but at the end of the line, it's not a location of fresh resources. It's always reallocation from one place to the other. And you, in fact, know exactly what happened with AMIS. So it's never more money coming in. It's most of the time will be reallocation. In some exceptions, of course, there will be more, more money. And the same thing is what we're trying to push with the World Bank on the on the food losses, you know? how we can really identify the problems uh, and agree because that's where the private sector has to play a role to also them measure so that we can come up with a, an overall solution rather than just saying, okay, we're going to do a massive baseline across the world. Uh, Astrid? I, I think the G20 is also a huge opportunity for countries to showcase what's working and when my wish would be that, for example, in the area of youth uh, working on education in Africa, how to bring that forward, that we would have some concrete uh, proposals of measures which work in, 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 in Africa, for example, but also in other countries. Thank you, David. Y yes. Um, I think that about the question of how you price natural resources 
and, and the fair price of, of your agricultural production. The G20 itself ca cannot do a lot, but basically the responsibility of each country to, to manage its own resources and to try to sell it at the right price on, on world markets. Now, uh, what the G20 can do is, as Astrid has said, share experience about how to do it and the potential long-term consequences of not doing it. Uh, but to answer Rob on, on the question of what the G20 can do on trade, uh, for instance, I think that we have to be pragmatic in the sense that, as I've said before, you have some player that doesn't want to talk at the WTO, that has a problem with the multilateral system, while at the G20 they can come with a plurilateral deal, you know? You bring the 19 most important countries and you find the deal, for instance, about this uh, package on export restriction versus import restriction. What type of disciplines or dialogue and how we can use AMIS or the Rapid Response Forum or the WTO to try to share information on, on this and to put some limitation of the unilateral action of big players. So basically it's to work on this plurilateral label that may be a little more popular than the multilateral label right now. And after, when you manage to get this deal, two or three years after, you, you give the baby to the WTO and you extend the concession. Thank you, David. Can we finish this round with Eugenio and then Agustin? Yes, I, I leave for Agustin the difficult question about how to price water in the Mercosur. Uh, I'm going to the uh, the point that Rob mentioned. During, um, during the the starting of the G20, I was at the executive board of the Inter-American Development Bank, and one of the things that happened is not only the IMF, it was the, the replenishment of capital to all the banks. Uh, there was a, a big fight to make sure that all the banks were included in the, and Jonathan was at the Treasury at that time. Um, eh, so yes, it, it, was, it was important to get, first, it was the, the, the importance of stretching the balance sheet of the banks to make sure that the banks could uh, answer to 2008, 2009 problem. And as, as I said, I was at the board, I was the chairman of the Budget and Financial Policy Committee, so we had to, a lot of work to make sure that we stretch the balance sheet. Once you stretch the balance sheet, the que next question is, well, we need more capital, and that's the second part. And the G20 was helped a lot in, in getting this, this part. So first, first point, yes, the G20 helped a lot in expanding the public sector funding during the crisis. Now, the, my, my point now is, and it's the point that the presidency of Argentina is making, for infrastructure, they are saying, okay, we have $80 trillion in private sector assets. Is it possible to create the in, um, infrastructure as an investable private sector asset that can help mobilize part of those resources? So my, the point that I was making is that we need to do also the same for um, for climate smart agriculture, irrigation, land degradation, etc., And for that, it's not a fund to finance the final investments. It's a fund to prepare projects that can be structured in a way that the private sector, that now they are saying we have the liquidity but there are no projects, then those projects can be prepared. Those projects do not come up out of the thin air. They have to be prepared. Uh, my, my own experience in the 70s and 80s preparing projects, you know, you have to be on the ground working with the farmers and, and that it takes time and money. So where, who is preparing projects that are climate smart and sustainable, et cetera, that help with climate, climate uh, change and, uh, and who's preparing those projects? And to the extent that you don't have a facility <coughs> that helps mobilize the resources to prepare those projects, then you will not be able to mobilize the private sector money, which now is the main pocket of money that I think we need to mobilize. So that. Well, I, I agree with the, the importance of pricing natural resources, but unfortunately, I don't know how to do it. Uh, but, well, in, in Argentina, Farmers, of course, are, are asking, why do I have to apply these good agricultural practices if I don't, I don't receive any higher price in, in exchange? So we are working a lot. We have a, an experience on launching a, a, a good agricultural practices network composed of public and private institutions. In Argentina, it's coordinated by, by the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange. So we are, we are working on f first defining uh, which are those practices, 
then uh, on develop, de developing the, 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 indica the indicators and then the incentives. We, th this morning, for example, um, a resolution from our government was published with a new program giving incentives to, to good agricultural practices. So we are, we are researching on that and we hope that farmers could realize uh, uh, about the, the importance of applying these practices first receiving uh, some kind of subsidy we don't have the, the funds but uh, but we are uh, this initiative are, are giving some some in exchange for example in, in one of the provinces in the Argentinian provinces that is Cordoba well Cordoba developed a, a new program and they are giving some subs subsidy in exchange of the the adoption of good agricultural good agricultural practices so this is the, the experience that we want to to share with the world and well to 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 study more about the the, the, the better the, the best incentives so to to help our farmers to to apply these these kind of practices thank you very much agustin um do you have a question yes uh, what would be your recommendations to the g20 um on this important agenda thank you Thank you. And we also have one question um, from someone online. Uh, yes, it is from uh, Associate Professor Sumer Hasimoglu in Germany. And the comment question is, the appropriate measurement of food security is critical for targeting food, evaluating nutrition, health, and development programs. Specifically, we describe measurement tools on per capita. Recent stochastic population projections yield wide error bounds and other error comes from PC evaluation because it does not account for younger 0 to 19 and older 65 plus age groups and gender differences. I have calculated that on unit basis for 20, 24 year olds that I called it per adult human unit. The error level on PC evaluation is 19.4 percentage unit. The question is, do we still have to use error bound per capita evaluations? All right. Thank you. Um, we are going to start with the uh, first question. I think that uh, Maximo, uh, if you don't mind answering that one first. So uh, w when we did the Turkey G20 uh, and, and it came up, the idea of having a platform on food loss and waste, uh, which FAO and IFPRI is leading still, the idea at that point was to reduce asymmetry of information of the numbers and the policies and the practice that countries were putting in place. So normally we believe that uh, food loss is only for developing countries and waste is for developed countries, but not necessarily true. We waste a lot in developing countries too, so I think we need to move the agenda in parallel. But that was only a platform to reduce asymmetry of information. What, what is the problem and, and what is what I hope we can move forward now? The problem is that uh, we have an aggregate number, okay, with X, Y, and Z methodology, but the aggregate number doesn't tell us where the problem is. It just tells us if it is correct. It tells us an idea of, of what is the magnitude. Uh, but but the, the issue is how we can implement practices to resolve those problems. So what I would like, at least uh, in the board of the bank, is to come up with projects that are resolving problems that we are identifying that will reduce the loss and waste. Because that's linked to sustainability, because I am using my resources in a better way. Uh, and I am basically taking profit of what I am producing. Uh, and, and the goal and where we are trying to push is to agree on a common platform of a metric that will allow to measure this at the micro level by key commodities. Of course, every commodity will be different because the specificity, specificities of the commodity make the, the way you ask the questions different. But at least if we can agree for core commodities, a framework that can also be applied by the private sector, I think that will give us a good baseline that could be used to capture the SDE, that 12.6, I think, which is the one of food loss and waste, and which allow us to then see what is the effect of the MDBs and others in terms of projects and implementation of projects that will resolve those gaps in which node of the value chain. And that is linked to everything we are talking is linked to trade, to NTVs, to barriers, it's linked to input markets. So wherever is the problem. What we see when we try to measure that is that sometimes we believe that the problem is something which is not really the case. And sometimes it's just a policy failure. Like they are deploying uh, packages of technology in the wrong moment. And therefore, nobody can use it or they don't use it properly and you get lost. So if we can have that metric and agree with the G20 countries as an example, and bring in the private sector through the B20 and the other private sector mechanisms, I think that will be a huge step forward towards complying with SDE. Thank you. Um, anyone else? 
would like to add something, David? Yes, I will address a more technical uh, question. Now, uh, my first comment is that, you know, we should not be afraid all the statistics we use have mistakes. Even one of the most simple measurement of hunger that is a prevalence of undernourishment is a statistical construct. Okay? We are not counting the people that are hungry. We are not counting really the people that feel food secure or are objectively food secure. And of course, bringing more information can help to have an idea of the magnitude of the problem. But the key issue is that it's not government that feed people. Okay? Governments are here and the G20 countries are here to give the condition that farmers can produce and consumers have enough income and jobs to buy the food they need. So the exact number of, of problems and what will be the population in the future and how the demographic will change, no one knows exactly what it will be. But as Maximo has said, there is some um, bottleneck problem that can be identified and with resource we can identify them and then find solution. And if it is a solution that the government or that collectively government can solve, it's good. And the other part of the G20 that we want government to not create more problems that already we have. And that will be uh, a nice thing for Argentina to get no more problems. No additional problems, sorry. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Astrid, do you want to add something? Uh, maybe just to underline your point that we don't really know how complicated it is to measure food insecurity. I just wanted to refer to an incident where I participated in a discussion, what are the criteria? And they were saying, okay, in Africa we're looking into households, how many um, chicken they do have, you know? And if a household has, I don't know how many chicken and person, then they are food secure or not. But then an African guy told us, well, but you know, the chicken are just for the men. The women don't eat them. So even if you have these kind of criteria, it's not so obvious. It's really complicated. But I think I agree we have to work with what we do have and try to find the, the right criteria on, on it. Regarding food, was, uh, food loss and waste, I wanted to say, especially in waste, um, and I think this is true for all countries, uh, I'm coming back to the multi-stakeholder, to outreaching. I think we need to have um, more examples and to look into the capabilities uh, and the skills of people to uh, explain what is waste and where we can do this. I think uh, a, a huge part of the problem is that we all know about it and it's good to learn where it's exactly and then to find ways to explain how we can also as individuals solve these kind of questions. Thank you, Astrid. And we have time for just one more uh, question, Raju. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is such a fascinating panel. I listen to you. Part of me is excited, part of me is worried, and part of me is confused. <laughs> um, and the part that's confused wants to ask the following question. I'm struggling to find a role, building on David's uh, comment earlier about the politics, the environment in which we are operating currently. Uh, and uh, I'm struggling to find a way in which uh, to ask you, and forgive me that it's not as well crafted as it should be, is the G20 relevant today? And how would we make the G20 more relevant if it is not about more money? Uh, which I'm glad it's not about more money because you can't keep throwing money at a problem. Is it about elevating issues? Here I'm struck with Eugenio's point about, and David's point about the bridge. Argentina being a bridge, bringing some issues on the table. Eugenio threw a little nugget out there and didn't build on it about health and obesity and overweight. And I was thinking about some of the big reforms taking place in Latin American countries or some of the big experiments taking place. But I still ask myself, and I'm curious to hear from you, how do we make, is G20 as relevant today as it has been in the past, or how do we make it more relevant um, today in the environment in which we are operating, which is different from 10 years ago? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, some of you mentioned climate change, you know, and, you know, I was thinking about the, the Paris meeting, the, 21 when, when where there was a, 
an accomplishment in the sense of including food security and agricultural production importance, but in a general manner. And then later on in the meeting 23 in Germany, there was a step ahead in the sense of asking to, to work in detail in, in what uh, uh, has to be done. Is there a way to, to link this uh, these uh, uh, two topics about, about, I mean, the work of G20 with uh, the climate change, uh, uh, I mean, uh, and results of the 23 meeting in Germany. And the other other question, no, uh, some of you also already talk about fo food security. When we, uh, when we read the concept of food security of a FAO, it seems to me that it's not a very clear concept. Maybe there will be the need to to work again in this concept, in the sense that the concept just says that uh, there is the need to to have access. But what happened, for instance, if I think of Mexico, we are growing a lot in our exports, but we are more dependent in basic food. I think that maybe food security should be a concept more related to basic food for most uh, people, especially poor people, instead instead of just thinking about uh, having access and money to, to buy food, you know, to be focused on basic, basic products, you know. Thank you. Um, any one that would like to answer? Eugenio? The, the point I think is very relevant what Mark Antonio mentioned, but I'm going to focus only on, uh, on Rajul's point of the G20 relevance. I think the, the, the relevance is the fact that it's unstructured. So it's not an institution. Uh, so you have free will in discussions, you bring topics, the topics change because you have different countries being the president at po point in time. So you have like a sounding board of the problems that may be happening at some point in time. So, um, and I would be, it would be good if it, it's maintained as a sort of sounding board of main problems at the world level, getting to consensus, getting data, et cetera, et cetera. That's during tranquil times and of course during crisis, then it's important to have some coordinated responses, being financial or the aim is, et cetera. So I think the, this is the relevance uh, for the G20, and it very much depends on the, the members to maintain it fresh and up, up to date and, and focusing on the main topics. And that allows this renewal of concerns and a continuous dialogue base, hopefully, on data. To add to that, I think today the G20 is more relevant than the other Gs uh, because of the countries that are involved, uh, although it's not an institution. But again, the only way uh, you will really remember the G20 in Argentina is if the content is correct and if you can come up with at least one, you don't need 20, if one or two initiatives that you can push forward. And that's where I believe that they will require some accountability. Uh, so we need to put some lines of accountability to see what is the progress. But the the dialogue of the G20 countries, I think, is extremely relevant. To Marco Antonio's question, I, I think on climate change, the most important thing, at least for me, is volatility. It's changes, variation, and that brings in uncertainty. And that's another topic that was touched in the Mexico G20, uh, which is how we can cope with risks uh, and how we can bring mechanisms of insurance which are accessible to all. In developed countries, insurance is extremely subsidized. So how we can do the same in, in our countries? And again, data is important because that will reduce the risk for the reinsurance company. So how we can find ways in which we can create this common public good that will allow more access, it will be very important. In terms of the definition of food security, it's pretty complex the definition that you have right now. No? It's availability, uh, quality content, whatever. So, so it depends on what is your target. There are other tools that are available, like level of hunger and so on, and so the hunger scale and so on. So I, I, I don't think we should waste more time in changing definitions. I, I think we should use our time more efficiently in, in targeting what we want to resolve and figure out ways how to proper target. If not, basically what will happen is you will have another panel of two years and come up with a new definition with one more complexity and another keyword that doesn't mean nothing. 
All right, we're running out of time, but if David, if you want to just mention. Yes, no, I think the G20 is quite relevant, as Maximo has said, by the composition. Basically, we need uh, a structure where we have OECD plus the BRICS to, to discuss issues. And the question is, is the world better with this structure than without? I think it's better with. Uh, we have seen that in other um, institutions right now, the dialogue is not working. And you should not expect anything coming from the annual UN uh, Assembly to really uh, bring this detailed uh, discussion. And same thing, Davos is nice for tourism, but there is no concrete discussion by policymakers compared to what is done within the G20 in an informal way, sharing ideas, uh, and we need sharing ideas to solve the problem. Thank you very much.